Hi, uh, my name is Diptanu. I, I work at Netflix. Uh, I work uh, in the platform engineering group at Netflix. Uh, uh, I usually work on distributed systems, on infrastructure stuff, uh, things like service discovery, um, IPC, um, and in general are, is very interested in um, uh, designing systems which are highly resilient and highly available all the time. Uh, before Netflix, I used to work at a company called ThoughtWorks. Um, and uh, in my free time, uh, in my copious free time, I uh, work on things like OpenMRS, uh, RapidSMS, and many other ICT 4D projects. Uh, if you are interested to make a difference in the world, uh, being a technologist, these projects are really cool, uh, and uh, they embrace uh, developers like us with open arms. Um, so a word about Netflix. Um, it's a video streaming company. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's about 16 years old. Uh, we have uh, around 2,000 uh, employees. Our office is in the sunny uh, Los Gatos in California. We have over 50 million users, and last quarter we streamed more than 5 billion hours of video. Um, if you walk around the halls of Netflix, um, the, uh, this line uh, you will hear quite a bit. It's called freedom and responsibility. Uh, engineers get a lot of freedom to do the kind of projects they think is going to help the company, help the product and at the same time, uh, very responsible and being accountable for the work that we do. And uh, taking a cue from this, uh, almost last year, uh, around the same time, I started a project called uh, the Titan project, the Titan framework. And I have been working on this uh, the last uh, 12 months or so, seven days a week, uh, 12 hours a day. Uh, and this is the first time I'm publicly speaking about this project, so I'm very enthusiastic and very excited. Um, so. So let's just jump in, like what is the Titan framework? The Titan framework is a globally distributed resource scheduler, right? Uh, it offers compute resources as a service. Um, if, you, if you are an application developer uh, who wants uh, to run applications uh, on the cloud, um, consume uh, CPUs, uh, disk, and uh, network resources, uh, you basically uh, co consume that uh, via Titan, uh, via an API call. Uh, we have been on AWS for a long time, um, and uh, um, all, our, all our systems are highly uh, designed from the ground up to be highly resilient and highly available. People really don't like when they can't watch Breaking Bad, so we had no other options, right? Um, so, uh, so going back to that, uh, so we have been on AWS, and AWS has worked really well for us. Uh, we use things like auto scaling groups. We use uh, we make sure that all our services are deployed in all regions. Uh, all our services are deployed in multiple availability uh, uh, availability zones. Uh, but at the same time, like there is a lot of work that happens behind the scenes when we deploy. Uh, we have a good continuous delivery story. Like everything in Netflix is optimized uh, for us to deliver faster. So going back to that. Um, so the story around continuous delivery has been great, but at the same time, developers still uh, think about how they want to supervise their process on a server, right? How do they, uh, what do they do to basically configure everything well in a server? Uh, so we do golden images and things like that, and that has worked really well for us. But at the same time, the, uh, the level of entry to the cloud is still at a scale of like 15 to 20 minutes. So it, it still takes us uh, from the time we write software to going to a test environment and to prod, it still takes like 15 minutes or so. Um, and last year, like I was wondering, like can we do better? Can we shorten the 15 minute cycle or 20 minute cycle to less than uh, say five minutes? Or even better, can we shorten that cycle to less than like a minute, right? What do we do to get there from 15 minutes to one minute? And when you are already at 15 minutes, like the bar is really high, right? And uh, to do something in this space uh, where the bar is really high, like something has to change like fundamentally. So we started thinking about uh, how do we uh, consume resources on the cloud today? And, uh, and that's where like Titan started. And I'm going to explain to you like how, uh, what the architecture of the system is and how we, uh, how we basically do things behind the scenes. Um, so the guiding principle, again, going back to the last slide, is we are always designing for resiliency and availability. I, as a, I, as a developer and a, and a person who is running my services, the first thing that I think when I'm writing a line of code that I need to sleep well at night, right? We don't have an ops team. 
We don't have people like who are managing servers and things like that. We as developers manage our own servers. We run our own services. Everybody in the company, um, uh, up to people who are VPs of engineering, they are on pager duty, right? So everybody is on pager duty. So a lot of our architecture is, um, you know, like uh, geared towards that. Uh, we love uh, availability over consistency. Like in 2001, I think uh, Eric Brewer's seminal pa paper on this uh, had eaten lunches of all the people sitting in this room, like who work on distributed systems, right? Uh, consistent systems are really uh, easy to reason about, but uh, they come with a price, they come with a cost, right? Um, on the face of uh, network partitions, uh, they are not available. So uh, what, when we started thinking about resource scheduling, like we saw that a lot of our, lot of systems in this space uh, are highly consistent. But we wanted a globally available uh, system which is highly available across multiple fault domains. And also uh, scheduling is a very, uh, uh, is a very specialized thing. Uh, and what we have seen is different teams and different people in Netflix had different kinds of scheduling needs. Some people were doing um, things like um, workflows where uh, they would do a job and then after the job finishes, they would run five other jobs and that would become like their algorithm uh, or machine learning pipeline, right? So things uh, are very much like workflow-ish. And then there were some teams which needed to do stuff when a data becomes available. Like say when um, so a video becomes available, they want to run some encoding jobs, for example, right? Or when, um, when certain feed is available, they want to do some training on uh, how a user is viewing his, his videos so that they can recommend newer stuff for the, for the user uh, for the next day. So uh, we saw that uh, the systems which are doing the actual workflow and decisions of when a job has to run is very specialized. So there was no point for us to build like a workflow system. Um, we wanted to build like a low level scheduling system that teams can build infrastructure on top. Um, and the other thing is all scheduling systems like were uh, geared towards, um, geared towards uh, running in isolation. But in Netflix, like we run everything in an active active mode. So if something happens in the East Coast uh, of United States, uh, you can be rest assured that we will still be serving Netflix from other data centers around the world, right? Um, so in that sense, like if we wrote a scheduling system and a resource allocator, which would be the kernel for uh, everything that runs on our cloud, that better be active active, that better be globally distributed. Um, so that was, those were like the high level guiding principles and every applications, every systems that run in Netflix, like, you know, are, are based on those um, tenets, right? Um, so, so before we go to like the future of where Titan takes us, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, the current uh, architecture, like how we do stuff today. And, uh, and this, has, this has been the workflow that has taken us to 50 million users. So this system has worked really well for us, right? So, uh, so I just wanted to like touch, touch upon that. So when developers like me, like we commit to Git, uh, we have a service called Bakery, which basically then takes the artifact and bakes a golden image, and then it pushes it up to, it registers with Amazon, right? And then we have a system called Asgard, and uh, Asgard is like our cloud deployment system, and Asgard then takes, it, takes, that, takes that image and you know, shoves it onto AWS and creates an auto-scaling group. And auto scaling groups for us are like uh, thousands of machines, or um, you know, like literally like thousands of machines in every uh, every um, Amazon's region. Um, we don't really uh, diagnose like, or we don't look at servers or application with their names. We look at clusters. For us, an ASG is like the um, like a unit of deployment. Like we don't deploy in like uh, we don't deploy like a server or like two servers or whenever a problem arises, we don't look at node level details. We look at like uh, what is happening in a particular ASG. So that's pretty much um, like how things work. And this has been fine. Um, and we have this concept of like a base army. So a base army, what basically it means is that we have a foundation image which has all the uh, like the security updates and things like that. And on top of that we have Tomcat and we have HTTPD and stuff like that. So this is cool if you're developing on Java. But what if, if you develop on Node.js or what if you are writing a machine learning thing or a statistic thing in R? Like we have seen that most of the developers like who are out of the PAVE path in Netflix, like they face this problem of, you know, hand tuning the base army with the things that they need. They have to now worry about putting Nginx in front of like four or five uh, node processes 
and that's where things start to get fuzzy a little bit. Like all our infrastructure, which was uh, which was really optimized for running JVM applications on Tomcat, doesn't really work well for those edge cases. And now we needed a better solution for that. And Titan was that was supposed to be that solution, and we tried to do that with this project. Is that we said that you are no longer thinking thinking about server. Stop thinking about servers. Think about CPUs and memories and disk and network resources that you need. Now that you know that you need this much resources and things like that, now you are no longer, you need to worry about process supervision as well, right? We do process supervision as a service. You say that this is your application, this is the bunch of uh, compute resources you need, and uh, you move away from this base army model, right? The base army model has been fine. Uh, if you're doing like a big gigantic application which, uh, which you know is going to run reliably on a server, but um, in some use cases, like this is um, like a big hammer. So uh, why did we need like a distributed scheduler? Like this was a point of contention at Netflix for a long time. People were like, we have been doing just fine with the ASGs. Like why do we need a new scheduler, right? And uh, most of the need that we saw for a new scheduler came from that ASGs are good if you have homogeneous things running. If you have a homogeneous long running service, then ASGs are great, right? You have a daemon and you want to run a bunch of those daemons um, at scale uh, in a given AWS region, it's like really nice. But what about those workflow systems, right? What about systems which basically has to start and then stop and then, you know, based on availability of something, like it starts some other services. So you need like um, a much finer grain scheduler which can uh, look at things and decide whether a, a process has to run or not. Um, also, uh, towards, I think, uh, a year and a half, we started doing active-active. Uh, what it meant was, uh, I don't know if you remember, like, I think two years back, there was a ELB outage, um, uh, Christmas, Christmas Day Eve or something. Um, so that was, like, not nice. And then uh, we started running Netflix out of US West 2 and uh, US East 1, and uh, there are talks about active-active uh, that my colleague uh, Ruslan gave. Uh, I think if you look on the web, You'll find some talks about that. But basically, the direction of our architecture moved to an active-active manner. Everything that we run, everything that is customer-facing is active-active. Now, we are a company which have done microservices at scale. Literally, there are like four, 500 microservices, which are every time like you click a button, like you, you rest assured there are four, like hundreds of microservices like working behind the scenes to serve you that data. Right, so when you have 400 applications or like hundreds of applications which you need to like move from one region to another, it's not fun, right? It's not, it's, I mean, we are managing it, we are doing it, we are doing a great job. Uh, we have services which understand like how much, um, how much we need to scale up in a region before we can move the whole traffic from one region to another, but things are getting complex, right? The more we grow, uh, the things are going to get even more complex. Um, and, and I already talked about it, right? Uh, we, everything at Netflix is designed for faster turnaround. Uh, our, we were still doing like 15 minutes uh, deployment. We wanted to like reduce that as well. Um, and uh, again, we have uh, things like Scryer, uh, which are basically like our service for doing auto-scaling. So on cloud, auto-scaling is like a must. Like everybody does auto-scaling these days. But we have gone one step further. Right? Everybody does auto-scaling, but most of the auto-scaling is like reactive auto-scaling. Like what happens when uh, load average jumps beyond a certain stage, like you start scaling up. But we can't scale up when load average jumps to a certain point, right? Because by the time load average has jumped, like things might be already bad. So we want to predict the, uh, the place where our, uh, where our uh, number of servers or number of applications should be. So we do uh, predictive auto-scaling where we see uh, historical data and we do linear regression and stuff like that and we find out like how many servers we need to be running. So those kind of stuffs become very easy like if we have a distributed scheduler because then you can do gang allocations, right? Instead of starting or, allo or doing auto-scaling for one uh, microservice, you basically auto-scale like a whole graph of microservice because when you are scaling up a front-end microservice, the things that are behind it are going to get slammed, right? So there is no point in auto-scaling like one particular service. You need to scale up the whole graph. Uh, so a distributed scheduler like is going to sort of like help us in those um, directions as well. Uh, 
Uh, we are not alone in this. Uh, this stuff has been done uh, in Google like since, I don't know, like, I think Kelsey Hightower was talking about this this morning. Like, a lot of people are doing it and have done it. Uh, Twitter has been running Aurora for a long time. Uh, SoundCloud has something called Harpoon. Uh, Facebook has Tupperware, and then Mesosphere has Marathon. Uh, so there are already like a, he like a ton of those things uh, that are out there. Now, the question that I get asked, and I think you might be thinking, is if there are so many things, like why did this guy go and build his own thing again? Uh, promise you, it was not like because it's fun to write this. Um, it's fun to write, but uh, at the same time, like there were real reasons, right? Uh, we wanted like a native, um, a cloud native scheduler. Like everybody like who are doing stuff, um, for example, um, Aurora uh, came from Twitter's data center, right? Like, Aurora is like how Twitter runs their data center. Um, we are not on the data center. There are things that you need to worry about if you are in a data center, like rack locality and things like that. For us, like we don't know like which rack we are placed in. We are on the public clouds, right? So for us, like if we care about things like fault domains, for example. For us, we we care about like who we are co-tenant with, like that that sort of things, right? So we decided that we want to write a scheduler which doesn't assume that we are on the data center, which assumes that we are on the cloud, right? That's like the first thing. The second thing was a lot of times like people start writing a scheduler and they're like, oh, we have uh, reached the potential of a single data center, now how do we get to the second data center? And we are already running in multiple geographies, so we wanted like distributed scheduling across multiple geographies, like from the get-go, right? Um, and I said like different teams, uh, I said earlier that different teams have different needs for scheduling, like different workflow systems and all. Uh, we wanted to write a low level scheduler, which can basically then be utilized by other teams uh, for writing things like uh, uh, cluster managers for long running services, workflow systems for batch processes, uh, even things like SAMSA for example. SAMSA works with Yarn uh, by default, uh, but we want to run SAMSA on our scheduler. Because we are handling a lot of things like uh, active, active, uh, you know, we handle things like auto scaling and things like that. And we want things like SAMSA and Spark streaming to utilize those things that we have built in our scheduler. We don't want uh, like different cluster management system because uh, we believe that a centralized control plane gives us a lot of flexibility during the times of outage. Uh, so when an outage happens, like the first thing that you want to know is, what are the resources that are available to you uh, in the other data centers and what are the resources that are not, you know, that, are, that have gone bad in the region where, or in the data center where things have gone bad. So a single, um, a single, uh, having a single control plane, a single, con like a single scheduler has benefits even, even in those kind of a situation. Uh, we wanted to do persistent volumes. Uh, one of the things that came was, um, most schedulers today, like especially things which are based on Mesos, don't do don't have the guarantee that a job which has been terminated is going to be landing on the same machine again, because uh, you know those kind of schedulers are more geared towards stateful, stateless services. But I think in Mesos 22 and upcoming Mesos versions, they are going to uh, support persistent volumes. But one year back, like when we started, there was nothing like that. So we wanted persistent volumes. We wanted things like um, like uh, if you ran like a Redis on one of the machines, uh, you should be able to move the Redis process to a bigger box, but at the same time, you should be able to move the volume that Redis was writing to the newer box. Uh, I will tell you like how we use that. It's basically the, the thing that enables us to do is called ZFS on Linux. <laughs> but, uh, but that's pretty much it. Like nobody was doing it at that time. Um, so Titan was our means to that end. Um, so we also wanted to take like scheduling decisions. We didn't see that anyone else was doing it. Uh, like the kernel, uh, the kernel publishes a lot of metrics about C groups, right? And namespaces, uh, like what is the max limit, what is the ohm pressure and things like that. And nobody was really making scheduling decisions based on that. And I have seen that users uh, ask for like say 60 GB memory and like 14 CPUs, but they don't utilize all that, right? They want all that things because they think it's going to be nice to have all those resources, but they are not really using it. So what does it mean? That means that like we can do some further optimizations after running once or twice their application and then know what is the footprint. And then based on that, it's like JIT, right? Like first time Java runs, like, you know, it's a little slower, then the JIT kicks in and boom, your application, you know, starts, uh, you know, working better. 
So in a similar way, like we wanted to run your application, run applications that the users submit, um, uh, like once or twice, and then find out like what is the footprint like, and then place you in a machine which has the right amount of compute resources. And I used to be an SRE. Um, I am still an SRE. Um, and what it means is that during outages, like I, you know, the things that we do to uh, uh, make make our uh, make our decisions of how we move applications and stuff can become complex because of the hierarchy of microservices and things like that. Uh, I wanted, like, we wanted, like, provide, like, a liver for SREs to basically decide that is this how healthy a region is or how healthy a zone is, right? And based on that, like, move workloads. It's very e hard to determine, like, how hard, like, how healthy is AWS zone is because there are so many things like S3. There is S3. There is uh, the underlying network. There is EBS and things like that. And something going, like, something going, like. A little bad doesn't indicate the whole zone or whole region is bad. But sometimes it comes to like humans like deciding how bad something is and at that time it's really useful to give the operations people or the people who are on call to give the ability to do, to, you know, do, you know, turn the knobs around. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, that's pretty much like why we wrote Titan and uh, like I said, uh, Titan provides compute resources as a service. So this is like a template of like a JSON that you would basically uh, ask Titan to do. Uh, Rocker is an application that someone wrote at Netflix. Um, I like the name, so I <laughs> took it. And uh, you basically specify like which version of the application you want to run and in which locations you want to run the application. So if we, even if we have like multiple data centers across, you know, multiple fault domains, you as a user don't need to worry about all the data centers, right? You have one API endpoint where you uh, basically say that I want to run 20 instances of my application in data center one, uh, and data center two, 40 instances, and uh, data center 560. And each of these applications, I want like four CPUs and uh, 3200 MB memory and 40 gigs of disk, and I want two ports. Uh, and uh, restart the thing, restart my process on uh, if it fails, and then retry it like 10 times or something. Uh, this last uh, attribute is a little weird, uh, re restart on success. Like it came, it basically came from, we have seen even though people don't expect their jobs or their front end services or microservices to fail, sometimes they just exit with an exit code zero. But what they really want is they want to perpetually run their service. So in that case, they can say that restart on success. I don't care if it if the process exists, just uh, do a restart. Don't think about anything else. Uh, what does Titan doesn't solve? Titan doesn't have any service discovery. Titan doesn't do distributed tracing. Titan doesn't do a name service. This is where we differ from Kubernetes, for example, right? Or like Marathon. Uh, Marathon does like, um, uh, they use HAProxy, Ben Heinemann gave his talk this afternoon and he was talking about how Marathon does uh, service discovery. At Netflix, uh, we have something called Eureka, which is our uh, highly available uh, service discovery. We have uh, a distributed tracing library called um, SALP, which was uh, a Google Dapper implementation. Uh, we didn't want to reinvent all those because we knew that application developers have already written their application using Eureka and SALP and all that stuff. Why reinvent the wheel, right? Just solve the basic stuff and then let applications developers worry about IPC and service discovery at their, you know, the way they want to. And this actually like has helped us because we are not changing the way people are writing applications, right? If we told people that you need to do service discovery in a certain way now, people would have to rewrite their applications. It would mean that adoption of this technology would have taken time. But with this, now that we are out of those business, people can just, uh, you know, start, you know, putting their applications on Titan and they just like, they're good to go. Um, so what do we need to build a system like Titan, right? You need a resource allocator. You need a runtime for packaging and isolation of processes. You need a scheduler, right? You need a way to distribute artifacts. You need you need to be able to replicate all your uh, uh, applications and the application specifications across regions, and then you need auto scalers. That's it, right? Um, I'm going to like touch upon like how did we did land on the technology that we use for each of these, so that like you have a sense of like you know how what we were thinking and what our requirements were. Um, so our resource allocator needed to scale to like tens of thousands of servers in a single fault domain. Um, 
and uh, and we wanted it to do one thing really well and we didn't like really care about it doing a lot of other stuff and most of those things most of like like for example like I mean when I was looking at this like a year back like I felt that a lot of people were building like a full stack thing when they were really writing a scheduler um, and uh, it had to be battle tested we couldn't like run something which was alpha quality and you know bet you know something like running uh, Netflix services on that um, and we saw that Apache Mesos was really the only thing that could do what we want uh, Mesos did one thing really well at that time that was resource allocation and discovery of resources right uh, we didn't want Apache Mesos to uh, or our resource allocator to make scheduling decisions because scheduling decisions are very domain specific right you don't like how you do scheduling is should not be something that the resource uh, allocator uh, thinks about right um, so we have restricted Mesos to only say discovery of the resources discovery of like CPUs memory and disk um, and we have a custom scheduler at Netflix, uh, it's called Fenzo. Um, Fenzo is basically uh, the secret sauce uh, which basically does, um, you know, uh, allows us to, for example, uh, you know, run things in a specific way. Like you as an application developer might say that, you know what, I don't want to run my application with a, with a, in a place where there is a uh, Spark streaming job running because I know that Spark streaming is going to con con like get a lot of network IO and at the same time, I want to be on a machine which is which is doing other stuff but not network because I am myself network heavy, right? So those kind of stuff like application developers know about their system that we wanted, um, you know, we wanted to embrace and uh, that's really like what, you know, we, you know, the reason why we had to write our own scheduler. And I'll touch upon like more about Fenzo later. Uh, it's really awesome, it's pluggable and everything. So Mesos provides us an API basically uh, to launch tasks. We use Mesos like Ben Heinemann was talking about as a, as a service which does syscalls for launching tasks. And uh, we have our own executor because um, we didn't want Mesos to control the life cycle of the process, right? For example, if, a, if we start a process and, the pro and you as a user have said that I want you to be running this process perpetually. Now what would happen is if you are using Mesos the way Mesos is designed, then the process will exit and Mesos will tell the scheduler that the process has exited, now what do you want to do? Uh, I already know that for this process, because the user have told me to start it again, there is no point in going back to the scheduler and telling him, right? I know that it has to be restarted. So our executor understands those kind of things. So if a process exits, the executor restarts that process again and never tells Mesos that this process died, right? Because there is no point in telling Mesos that, right? Um, and it, it's, it, it allows us to do like distributed, like it allows us to, it gives us an API to do like things like messaging for example, right? Um, in distributed systems, messaging is like very, uh, is like a very common thing to solve and we didn't do anything special to solve that, right? Like where we wanted to send messages from tens of thousands of machines to a single uh, um, framework which is listening to whether a task is over or not and things like that, right? So we use Mesos for that. Um, so packaging, on the packaging front, um, we love immutable inf in, uh, infrastructure, right? Uh, it's like one of the holy grails of Netflix besides microservices. Um, and uh, this has worked really well because now we know that uh, for a particular version, like we are not, we are sure what is the uh, application that is running and what are the dependencies that it has. Like if you're running a node application, you would know based on the version of the node application which version of OpenSSL you have which version of, uh, you know, uh, the underlying libraries you have. Uh, so it, it's really cool. Um, we wanted like a, uh, pr you know, we wanted a flexible process for process isolation using C groups and namespaces because if you're running on Linux, um, you know, let's be honest with each other, right? Like that C groups and namespaces the way, are the way to do um, uh, process isolation today. Uh, JLA process in Linux. Uh, we know that Heroku has been doing it since like so long. It's been battle tested. Google had this, uh, this code has been in the Linux kernel since 2005. LXC has been around for so long and we knew that this was going to work. So there was no doubt that we want to do anything else. Uh, and we wanted like a good a way of tooling, you know, good tools and a distribution mechanism. Because when we are starting a project like this, we didn't want to uh, fight too many battles on too many fronts. 
uh, there was already a battle that we were fighting, that is write a scheduler, write, make it globally distributed and things like that. We didn't want to reinvent uh, our process isolation mechanism or write tools and write tutorials to make developers understand like how can they package uh, containers, right? Um, enter Docker. Uh, everybody loves Docker, um, and uh, and what 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 was cool about Docker is that um, what was cool about D Docker is that I didn't have to talk to people about how you can create container. And I go to people, I'm like, you can run on Titan if your application is in a Docker container. That's it, right? And after that, people go away on the web and they are like finding how to create containers, and there are like bunch of ways of creating containers. So that initial hump of adoption of how you can package your application in a, in a container is like solved because Docker is so popular. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of debates, internal debates about whether Docker is uh, really good or whether it's a new and shiny thing. Um, we found that uh, Docker, you know, like, we found that Docker works and there are things that we do, uh, you know, the way we use Docker is not the way Docker is used in general, like we do our own custom networking, we do our own custom volume management. Uh, we do things Docker a little differently than how most people use Docker. Um, but developers, on the other hand, like they use all the tools, the standard Docker tool chain to create containers. Uh, but behind the scenes, when we run the containers, like we do it a little differently. I'll, I'll uh, talk about it in a little bit. Uh, we love ZFS on Linux. Um, uh, we wanted uh, an API where users can specify that I need this much disk space and we wanted to do quota and we wanted to be able to snapshot and clone and uh, you know move volumes around and uh, uh, ZFS, note the version number, 0.6.3.2 is the version that you need if you are using ZFS on Linux. That particular version of ZFS like uh, works for us really well, uh, six, seven months uh, down the line, uh, knock on wood. We didn't see any outage because of ZFS. Uh, uh, we saw some interesting things about like how caching works with ZFS, um, but uh, it was pretty easy to, uh, you know, like tune ZFS. Having uh, Brendan Gregg, uh, who knows this stuff really well at Netflix helps. Uh, the one thing that I would, is on my wish list with ZFS is the libZFS. Uh, a part of a, a part of Titan is written in Go. Uh, most of the, most of Titan, including the scheduler, is written in uh, Scala. But the one the parts of Titan which works on the hosts are written in Go. And we are talking to ZFS via Go. And uh, the libZFS story is not so great. So if you are writing again programming against ZFS, um, uh, you know, like I would say that. If you're doing it today or tomorrow or the next month, uh, don't use the libzfs, use the uh, zfs CLI tools. Although I hear people in cluster HQ who are working on the same space are probably like going to improve libzfs, but who knows. Um, we, networking is a little complex. Uh, we are on both AWS uh, EC2 and, uh, uh, and AWS VPC. Um, and uh, in EC2, the networking environment is a little constrained for us. Uh, all containers which run on EC2 use the global network namespace. Uh, what it means is that each uh, container can see, basically has, you know, like, are basically using the same network interface. Uh, there is no isolation of networking, um, at least in EC2, because of this. Um, and the ports that are allocated to the containers are allocated via mesos. So if you are an application who want to do uh, run Catalina on 8080, it's, you can't do that on Titan uh, if you are on EC2 Classic uh, because you know, we have only a single network namespace um, and that works well in EC2. But in VPC, like we, we can attach an ENI per container, so every container gets its own IP address. Uh, and you can have the same uh, ports across all containers in your cluster. That makes it nice, uh, but for us, since uh, you know, like containers don't get most containers don't get traffic uh, directly from the internet. They're getting traffic from a service called Zool, which is our load balancer uh, that the edge services uh, run. Um, you know, like it won't be an issue. And for batch processing workload, like ports doesn't matter uh, because batch processing workloads are are only getting uh, packets from 
from the outside. They are not getting traffic from other services. Uh, but we don't really run any online applications which are serving traffic to Netflix customers on Titan. And uh, the day we run things on Titan, which are for which are web services, I'm pretty sure it will be in VPC where we can allocate uh, IP addresses to each container. Um, it just makes debugging easier, right? Uh, you don't need to like search for where uh, which port this particular service is on. Logging is a weak story right now uh, with Docker. Uh, there are so many different ways of doing logging, um, and uh, we don't we didn't really like the way logging works on Docker. Um, uh, what we really do is uh, we attach a volume like a ZFS volume um, on on every container which is mounted on slash log and slash logs. And whatever people write on those, um, basically we have an agent which basically collects those and pushes to S3 and archives it for the next two days or three days or something like that. It's, uh, and in that way, uh, what happens is when a container exits, um, people can still go to S3 and find the logs if they want to debug. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. Um, some some people have tried to mine the STD out uh, of every container, and I think that's not really efficient because the Docker daemon streams every log messages uh, to that you write on standard out. So I tell people that don't write on standard out, um, but we have to do something about it. Um, but so far, like this strategy has worked, like people writing to slash logs and we archive it uh, to S3. Uh, monitoring is a little complex, um, and again, this is something um, I felt nobody was doing uh, at that time. I think now with Docker 1.5, they have uh, the stats, the Docker stats. Uh, what we do is we don't we don't use the Docker API directly to get stats. What we do is we go to the sysfs c groups uh, thing directory, and for all the c control groups that we care about, like memory, CPUs, network, uh, we know which metrics to look for, and we are basically reading those text files directly and then we are pushing it to our monitoring system called Atlas. So that way all the users like who are running applications on Titan today can monitor uh, the, the statistics of uh, the performance statistics of their containers in real time. Uh, every, the scheduler gets a stream of metrics from every container uh, to make scheduling decisions, but so far like we haven't really worked on that area where we take really intelligent real-time decisions based on the metrics, but the scheduler gets the metrics anyways. So that's like something that we'll do in the future. We, we, we have seen a lot of times that uh, applications get killed by the ohm killer, and there was no way of surfacing that information up. So uh, people used to basically like, uh, you know, come on our channel and basically say, hey, dude, like my application crashed, and is it because of memory and stuff? Um, the way that we solved that was we hooked onto the C group, uh, notification API. Uh, so if you look at each C group directory, like there will be like a file where uh, the kernel is writing messages about uh, when an application has uh, reached the quota that it had asked for and it was killed because of, uh, because of that. So we basically alert users uh, based on that. Now comes the scheduler. Uh, so we have this pluggable scheduler that I talked about earlier, it's Fenzo. Um, and uh, it solves the problem that given you have M resources and N tasks, it matches the M resources with N tasks really well, right? It does that one thing really well. Uh, this is a little different than how Marathon is implemented or, or used to be implemented. I don't know what they have now. Uh, or other uh, Mesos frameworks are implemented. Uh, what people usually do is Mesos is an offer-based system. So you get an offer saying that I have an, you have an offer of two CPUs and you know, 50 GB RAM, and what do you want to do with it? You either take that offer or you reject that offer. You take that offer and then put a task that you can match and then ask Mesos to start it. We don't do that. Uh, what we do is we get an offer and then we make sure that we record the cluster state, right? So no Mesos framework, like based on my knowledge until now, like was recording the cluster state. Like they were basically taking real time decisions. Whenever an offer was coming, they were basically seeing what task can match and they were launching um, uh, a task. But what we do is we, we make a record of the cluster. So whenever we see an offer from a slave, we make sure that we know that this slave is, is present in our cluster, and then we do efficient bin packing. What it means is that, uh, for example, um, if you have a task uh, which, is, uh, which is gaining, uh, taking a lot of CPU, 
and then you immediately get a task which is uh, get which needs you know more as much CPU as the other one needed. What you would do is you know if you were doing best match scheduling, you will basically try to find the the server which has that much CPU and you will put it with them. Like you will you will try to basically uh, take the first matching offer that you have and show in a task there. But what we do instead is we don't uh, uh, put jobs on a machine just because there are enough resources. We put jobs, we co-locate jobs uh, in a way so that we know that they are complementing each other. Like some something which is network heavy uh, is not going to be with another task which is network heavy. Even though there is a machine which has enough CPU and RAM uh, to uh, physical memory to satisfy that requirement. So that allows us to do like much more uh, better schedule, take better scheduling decisions, right? Uh, and things like, for example, uh, GPU work, GPU stuff, right? Like some people are running uh, machine learning algorithms on GPU, and Mesos don't discover GPUs for you, even though there are uh, there is a there is a provision of doing uh, custom resources. What it means is that um, uh, what it means is that you can be in a situation where there are one CPUs, but there were five CPUs, and you gave all the five CPUs. Uh, to a job which needed only five CPUs. And then later, you got a job which needed a GPU and a CPU. So you don't want to give that instance which had the GPU uh, to the ones that doesn't need GPU at all. So uh, because we know the cluster state, like we can, you know, earmark certain machines in the cluster for certain types of workload. So that helps us um, to take care of those um, special cases. It also helps with auto scaling. I'm going to come to the auto scaling later. I have some diagrams which will help understanding like how we do auto scaling. Uh, so auto scaling is like a must uh, must need for every cloud application. Like if you are on the cloud, you are probably using auto scaling, right? Auto scaling is again of two scale. Two there are two levels of auto scaling. There is the first level is that you have thousands of jobs. Now you need to scale up the underlying host so that you have enough resources for those jobs. And then there is an auto scaling that you are running five applications and you need to match the SLA of that application. Say that you want the SLA of the application to be always less than five millisecond, right? The response times to be less than five millisecond. So then you are, no, you are scaling up the applications, right? So when you scale up the applications, then automatically, like obviously, like you need to scale up the resources as well, under, under the underlying resources. So we do like two, two levels of auto scaling and the uh, we do both predictive and reactive auto scaling for every level, but uh, they happen at different places. Titan doesn't do the uh, scaling of applications based on the application metrics because that's very domain specific, right? I do not know what domain you are working on. If you are a stream processing application, you, the metric that you would want your application to be scaled is probably like how many packets you are processing, right? How many uh, how many messages you are pro processing? If you are a web application, you want to do probably like response time uh, as your SLA. So Titan, which is very under, uh, very low level, uh, doesn't know about the domain that you care about. So we don't do application level auto scaling, but we give it to Scryer, which is another Netflix service. We do auto scaling of the underlying resources. When Scryer or something like Scryer tells us that I need to scale up and I need this much resources, that's when like Titan kicks in and it scales up, it brings in more machines. Uh, so reactive auto scaling is very simple. Um, you know, like Titan adjusts the number of machines an ASG has. Under the hood, we don't have one ASG. We have multiple ASGs because in Amazon there is like different types of instances, right? Like M34 XL, C2, I, the C2, and then the C3 machines, then R3 machines. These have different balance of memory and CPU. So there is no point in you know landing a job which is very CPU intensive on a machine which is very memory uh, optimized because then we won't be using all the memory. So we have like all these ASGs that we manage under the hood, but application developers doesn't need to worry about it. We land them on the right machines, right? And Titan was designed so that, you know, like in a way that people can run it everywhere. It doesn't need to be on AWS because Netflix is on AWS. Most of our OSS libraries are like that. They are built for, you know, we run them on AWS, but People have adopted um, Netflix OSs on um, on GCE, on Rackspace, and their internal data centers 
So auto scaling provider is pluggable on, on Titan. What it means is that if you are uh, using Titan and uh, you know when we open source it, uh, on GCE or someone else, uh, you can write a custom auto scaling provider and you will be getting the same kind of things that we get on AWS. Uh, predictive auto scaling is really simple. Uh, it's basically like a really, we do linear regression and curve fitting to basically know like how many resources we need um, based on historical data and like real time data. Um, so uh, this comes into the play when we want to uh, be always over provisioned and not like wait until the last minute uh, to bring in more machines. Uh, bin packing for uh, bin packing, like we do bin packing, uh, uh, Fenzo does bin packing. So what it means is that, say for example, you have node A, node B, and node C, and each nodes have 16 CPUs. Uh, even though you have service A, which need, which is a long running job, and you know which may not use all the 16 CPUs, you won't land a batch processing job on node A. We don't do that because what it means is that this service is probably going to be running perpetually or running for like seven days or eight days or something. But the batch processing guy is going to like come and end in say three hours or four hours. Say if we did put the batch processing job on node A, what would it mean is that our resources would be like highly fragmented when the batch processing job ends. Say we have 100 machines and we are mixing and matching batch processing and service type workload. What it would mean is that we won't be able to like scale down this node B when the batch processing application ends. But because we club applications which, which are of similar nature, what we can do is when the batch processing stuff completes, we scale down node B. And all the, uh, and the node A which, you know, which is running the long running service can take on more long running services. And that way like we avoid resource fragmentation. Uh, that's one of the benefits of remembering the cluster state. Um, um, and uh, that has been like uh, very handy for us to optimize and utilize uh, resources efficiently. Uh, the Mesos framework that we have is, uh, you know, like, mes so writing schedulers which are distributed in a single fall domain is like really hard. Uh, so, and we didn't try that. Uh, so our Mesos framework is like a single process Mesos framework. We obviously do highly high availability via, um, uh, via Zookeeper. Uh, we had some interesting problems with Zookeeper. It's not the most uh, nicest uh, software to be running in production uh, with, the, with the requirement of being highly available. I can see some smiles here. Uh, and uh, so we are moving away from Zookeeper. We are going to do Raft uh, where, uh, you know, every, every scheduler, every, uh, every Mesos framework in a given fall domain is going to be participating for leader election. What it means is that as long as we have one single Mesos, um, you know, single leader Mesos framework, we are good to go. We don't need to rely on Zookeeper anymore. Mesos still uses Zookeeper for leader election, but I saw a ticket where the guys uh, from Mesosphere are, uh, are basically working on a replicated log to do leader election in Mesos. So then we can get rid of Zookeeper altogether. Uh, we wanted to be uh, resilient um, on data store failures, even though we have written Titan on DynamoDB, uh, uh, which is highly available. Uh, even if DynamoDB goes down, like we wanted our Mesos framework to be still available. So what we do is we use log replication. Yeah, okay, I didn't mention it. Uh, so we use log replication uh, in our Mesos framework. So whenever a task update comes, like we use, we use some portion of Raft, which is basically distributing um, uh, information across clusters via logs to basically uh, propagate the information that a task has been over and all that. And whenever like the database comes back up, we'll sync back with the database. Um, so that was pretty uh, nice uh, when we had a DynamoDB outage. Um, it's globally distributed by nature. Um, we have, we don't do scheduling across multiple geographies. Uh, we do uh, scheduling Schedule, the scheduler only bothers about, is only bothered about doing scheduling in its own fall domain. Um, we run the whole stack, the whole Titan stack in every fall domain. Right now, a fall domain is a region, but in the future, in the coming months, when we run more mission critical applications on Titan, we will move about defining every AWS zone as its own fall domain. That's actually much better than saying that the whole region is a fall domain because then you, you will have more isolated failures. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Like we are still like, we still treat 
every region has a single fault domain. Um, so all job specifications that you are submitting that a user submit on Titan are replicated to all the fault domains. So even though you as a user might want to run your application only in one region where your data is or where your user is, we, we make sure that the data is replicated, the cluster specification and the containers, the Docker containers are replicated all over the globe so that if that region goes down, um, and we have seen that happen, right? Uh, when the region goes down, we can start your containers and your clusters in other regions, right? So, um, so that way, uh, you know, like we, you know, we, we are sure that when an outage happens, like we have a fallback option. All the replication uh, services, like they exchange heartbeat messages. Um, so when a zone goes bad, or whenever we see crashes increase in a given fault domain, we don't want to, we don't want Diptano to be getting paged in the middle of the night, right? The scheduler basically then understands that there is another scheduler who is having trouble right now uh, in another fault domain, like, you know, like it's time to start the cluster that he was running in my fault domain, right? So we do, we basically like multiplex hard, heartbeats. Uh, and uh, again, like this stuff needs improvement. This is probably like something we would keep improving in the future. Uh, there is a centralized control plane, however. Uh, if, if, if a user is running his workload in four or five different fault domains, uh, he, he probably won't like to see the status of his processes in every fault domain. So what we do is we aggregate the task status from every fault domain to a single fault domain. Um, it's, it's a very common pattern. Um, I think Google has a paper, uh, centralized control plane and distributed data or something. Um, I read it like few, like, I don't know, six months back. So it's pretty much like the same concept, right? Um, so Titan looks like this. Um, uh, we have, we sit on top of Apache Mesos and then Mesos sits on top of EC2. And then there are this bunch of applications that users have written, right? Uh, Spinnaker is our next generation cloud deployment system and it's not yet out there yet and we have not done the Titan integration but we are talking about a Spinnaker integration on top of Titan for running long running jobs. We, within like first month of, of the inception of Titan, what was cool was that we got this new service called Apollo Creed and Dagoba which two other teams who are not part of my team, they wrote uh, which sits on top of Titan today and are doing like workflow like systems. Uh, there is a new service that I just saw like last week, uh, which is using Titan now, it's called Mason. Again, like that's again uh, a uh, workflow system that some people have written for their specific use case. We are trying to now port uh, Apache Samza to use Titan instead of Apache Yarn, so that like all the benefits that Titan brings onto the table, like Samza gets it out of the box. We, I, I mean, we would love to have uh, Spark streaming uh, and Spark uh, cluster running on Titan, although like Sparks works natively very well with uh, Mesos, but there are some advantages of running Spark on, on Titan. That work has not been done, um, and uh, this is something that we would like to experiment in the future and see if it's even possible. Um, even the Samza work is like for the future. Um, we haven't, we know like how to do it, but we have not seen it in production yet. Uh, yeah, the, what is the future? Uh, more robust scheduling decisions, uh, optimize the host uh, where we run stuff for running containers, uh, more monitoring goodness, and uh, you know, that's pretty much it. And like to take questions now. So any predictions on when Titan will be open sourced? Uh, yeah, uh, I have been, I, we have talked about it uh, internally, I think around November. Uh, I have not written a single line of documentation. <laughs> so it won't be really useful even if I open sourced it. Hi, um, you mentioned that um, there's like no point in landing a job that is CPU heavy on a RAM heavy machine. Uh -huh. Now now I could imagine a situation where maybe you've got um, like reserved instances, right? You have this RAM heavy machine that's available or maybe um, there's some AWS pricing change yeah. or maybe you're looking at spot instances yeah. where you could have, um, you know, RAM heavy machines that have an adequate level of CPU or um, 
Yeah, I've seen wild things in that volatile spot market where oh. there are machines with like far more CPU oh. resources than you need that are available at a price lower than um, a machine that has sufficient resources for oh. your needs. So I was just curious if, if pricing is a factor in the resource pr provisioning decisions. Yeah, so I mean, Netflix is like an interesting place uh, when it comes to like how our applications are run in the cloud. Like we have so such big, like our footprint is so big that I mean, it doesn't matter at that stage because we have so many servers, but yeah, I mean, if we don't have absolutely any machine, right? Like, and then we have some machines which are lying. Like, for example, we have a, like a pile of a particular type of machine and they are not balanced for the type of workload that we want to run, then obviously like Titan will place a job in those machines. Like, we don't want a job to be queued just because we are not finding the right machine. Like, like the cloud is someone's data center at the end of the day. So what it means is that some type of machines can be unavailable for a certain durations and we have seen that happen. It's very normal. Uh, so in that case, like, uh, you know, like, you know, we land, uh, we land processes on whatever machine is there. Uh, so at this point, the fault domain is is at the region level. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how the heart heartbeat works then, or what the purpose? Yeah. So is? when I set up like a when when we set up like a Titan cluster, the first thing the Titan cluster does is it registers with the with the AWS Route 53 and says that hey, I am a new cluster, right? I am a new Titan fault domain, and we use SRV records to basically know that this is the URL of the replication service. And every replication service basically knows what other replication services are there, right? And from then onwards, when it knows that there is a new replication service, it joins that cluster of replication, right? Where it's basically sending heartbeats and everything. So it's basically a DNS base. There is no rocket science going on here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned golden images and Docker images. Uh, what's the rule of thumb when you use one or the other? I mean, we treat Docker images as golden, right? Right. I mean, at the that's why I was saying we love uh, immutable infrastructure, and Docker gives us a way to continue doing immutable infrastructure even with containers, right? Like, um, I have seen like some people, no, not some people. Like, I have like I've seen this pattern when I was a, when I used to be at ThoughtWorks. Um, you know, people use Alexi. They start an Alexi and then they install, then they run Chef or Puppet inside it. And then uh, he, I, I see Kelsey shaking his. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so um, so I've seen that sort of stuff where people run Chef and Puppet inside an LXC, and uh, I can tell you that that's you know like you know that's cool, but you know that has its downsides where you don't predictively know what version of things are inside it. And with Docker, like when the file system is packaged in a binary sort of a manner like the predictability becomes higher. It's almost like running an army at that point. Um, yeah. All right, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, if, you, if you are interested in this stuff, we can chat all night. <laughs>